For the next presentation, we have uh, Akshay and uh, Rasik from Apple. So thank you, guys. Thanks everyone for coming to our talk today. Akshay and I will tell you about scheduling notebooks on Kubernetes. I think you've seen a lot of Jupyter in <laughs> different presentations, so we'll tell you a little more about Jupyter and tell you a little more how we use it a little bit differently. So to introduce ourselves, Akshay is a senior engineer and is key to the foundation and evolution of our notebooks platform used at Apple. And I lead the interactive data science team in our data platform. And our charter is to provide notebooks and complementary technologies for use across Apple, allowing us to gain value from large data. So for the agenda today, we'll talk about Jupyter Notebooks, our usage of it, executing notebooks on Kubernetes, Airflow on Kubernetes, and then scheduling notebooks with Airflow. So to talk more about how we use Jupyter Notebooks, um, we benefit from the open source Jupyter ecosystem by providing a rich user experience for data activities with notebooks at the core via Jupyter Lab. Essentially, we make interactive data development, a data development environment available at the fingertips of data engineers, data analysts, and data scientists. Our envir environment allows data engineers to prototype production code for their needs, as well as providing analysts and scientists with the ability to write queries, code, and experiment. So what's great about this? Jupyter Lab is essentially a in-browser IDE, allowing users to use notebooks for building narratives and explainable documents using both code and text. Our users can dynamically launch interactive environments to use Python and or Spark to power their notebooks. And we have good extension points in the Jupyter ecosystem to integrate with other services, expanding the user experience. Today, our users can collaborate by sharing notebooks via Git or our internal sharing service. So to talk a little bit about our data tool set, there are a variety of data sources, including HDFS, S3, and Cassandra. Additionally, there is a Python and Scala in the ecosystem, like I mentioned, and we also support multiple flavors of Kubernetes. So there are quite a few technologies at play. Our users are able to launch small or large, on-demand, interactive clusters for writing code or queries using Python and or Spark. Given this tool set, our users' workflow can be non-trivial which makes sharing and collaboration a critical component of our user experience. So now to talk a little more about notebooks at cloud scale and complexity. We have a diverse user base using large amounts of compute to access and process large amounts of data using multiple clouds. Essentially, we provide a streamlined cloud-based interactive data development environment powered by Jupyter and hundreds or thousands of Kubernetes pods worth of CPU memory and disk available at their fingertips. But what's not great today, as notebooks have mostly been used in an interactive way, it's been a manual process to share code, outputs, and knowledge buried in the multiple notebook files of our users. Additionally, some data scientists or data engineers have to prototype code in a notebook and then take uh, that work and give it to a peer to use a separate means of promoting that code to a production environment. To reproduce work on an ad hoc or semi-regular basis, a notebook has to be manually executed by an individual or team members. And for like debugging failed data processing pipelines, one has to debug code by bringing it back into a notebook to pinpoint the error and fix it, and then manually propagate that fix back into a pipeline. Finally, Jupyter doesn't handle large-scale, long-running code well today, as connectivity issues can lead to lost output. Ultimately, we want to improve the productivity of our user base by addressing some of these pain points. So let's talk about taking Jupyter beyond interactive. We want to solve, again, for the large-scale, long-running sessions and also regular data processing jobs by allowing notebooks to be run in the background. We're moving towards a world of Jupyter-based applications, allowing users to more easily build data and ML workflows, where a user can run one notebook for data preparation and a chained follow-on notebook for ML training or similar. So let's ask ourselves a question. 
what would it look like to take data science code, configuration, kernel binaries, and execution outputs towards automated offline notebooks for teams in a scalable way with dedicated and isolated cloud compute. So to introduce the domain concepts, there are teams of users using pools of resources, um, interacting with notebook servers to write notebook files and generate outputs. And those notebook files are powered by kernels um, and we allow our users to customize kernels as needed. And there are kernel specs which are used to configure the kernels for, to give them like a good state, a runtime state. And then we also offer a central repository to find and use a configuration. And we also then provide the ability to share and administer those configurations for teams. So to talk about the Jupyter server ecosystem, on this slide you can see the APIs available in, the Ju in Jupyter's extensible ecosystem, some of which are used in a number of well-known extensions like uh, auto-completion, the Git extension, real-time collaboration, and Jupyter AI. We leverage this extensibility and will open source some of our work for both scheduling and sharing and publishing. Now I'll hand it over to Akshay and he'll tell us in detail how Jupyter fits into the bigger systems picture, allowing us to gain more value from notebooks. He will tell you about how we implemented our solutions to address both the interactive and the non-interactive use cases at scale. Akshay, over to you. Thanks, Russ. So, um, so this slide talks about our, our visual architecture of notebooks platform on Kubernetes. It essentially talks about using Kubernetes API to orchestrate notebooks. Our architecture consists of control pen components, which are uh, which include various orchestrators uh, like notebooks, other data platform service orchestrators, and our data plane. Um, uh, and our data plan consists of all the clusters which users tend to run um, these large data workloads. And these are owned by various teams. To, and each cluster is configured to run various system components like operators or other contraplan components which, which, which are responsible to manage the Kubernetes artifacts specific to that service. Like for example, notebooks operator would be responsible to manage the notebook server deployments and the PVCs to store these notebook files and the Spark operator would be responsible to create non-dependent Spark clusters in any given namespace. Talking about notebooks execution, every user is provided with a, a secure, uh, isolated workspace in a multi-tenant environment, which users tend to use to run their interactive use cases. So, and every interactive, um, so this back, so every interactive session actually is backed by a remote kernel, which is orchestrated or provisioned dynamically by our orchestrator. In a, in, a, in a data plan which is chosen by the user. So essentially decoupling this, um, our architecture with our control plane with the data plane allowed our platform or allowed us to scale our data plane across number of clusters and other, and also uh, uh, in multiple regions and other cloud, uh, in, in other cloud environments. And providing the ability for users to use the uh, launch remote kernel provided flexibility for the user to use um, a compute which is closer to the data right from their workspace. Now let's see how um, we've uh, solved the remote kernel execution. So we have extended the Jupyter kernel spec to actually represent everything uh, related to the kernel environment. Essentially, it consists of, uh, so that this uh, kernel, uh, kernel spec can be used for, to launch interactive experiments and also can be shared with others within, within various teams to reproduce the same experiments. Essentially, the kernel spec consists of the, um, the various properties, including the kernel image, which is the actual um, Docker image, which is run uh, uh, as a kernel on Kubernetes. And this, and this particular image is, is owned and managed by various teams at Apple for, for, to manage their dependencies for their specific use cases. And the kernel spec also includes various properties like CPU memory and the cluster namespace to run these kernels, along with other data access policies. So this kernel spec it would be used by the orchestrator to um, provision or uh, provision a remote kernel environment and configure this environment, like to um, to use init container to uh, configure the secrets by accessing our uh, secret store, and other policies like ingress policies such that only the, uh, the Jupyter workspace of the of the user can access this kernel, and also the egress policies as that the kernel part can access um, various data sources or data systems. Essentially. 
So using these policies allowed us to use or provision a, a, a remote kernel which is isolated and secure in a multi-tenant namespace or cluster. And users tend to run multiple versions of Spark or Python um, notebooks um, uh, right within the, with, in a specific namespace. So taking a deeper look on Spark cluster, it, is, it's, it itself is a large processing engine or large processing unit where users tend to run um, the, their workloads. It, it can consist of a long-running driver pod and other referential uh, executor pods, which can scale with dynamic allocation configured. And to optimize such these large workloads on cloud environments, the orchestrator is responsible to schedule and manage these uh, pods uh, in a different node groups with different scaling parameters with annotations and uh, other optimizations so that uh, we can uh, optimize on compute and cost on cloud environments. Essentially, with this architecture where we allow users to configure their, or data science teams to configure the kernel specs for their specific needs, needs and also uh, and orchestrator being responsible to dynamically provision these environments and optimize on cloud, cloud allowed our, our platform to scale for various use cases at Apple for multiple teams and also still operate at scale. Now, um, let's see how these concepts can be applied for, uh, to run a notebook uh, a, a, in a non-interactive use case. So to run notebooks, um, uh, to, today, Jupyter notebooks are widely used for interactive use cases, but uh, it, it can also be extended to, uh, to support non-interactive use cases where uh, a user can run this notebook on a regular schedule. Um, um, and um, Jupyter Scheduler is, is such an open source extension which provides ability for the user to um, run the notebook um, once in a background or on a schedule, and it also provides a uh, interface for users uh, to define or manage uh, all the pipelines within the right within the workspace and access all the historical runs for a specific pipeline and also downloads uh, uh, various um, output artifacts specific to that any pipeline in multiple formats. It also provides uh, another powerful uh, use case where users can convert a notebook document into a template by parameterizing the notebook document so that other users can just run the pipeline with the, sim with, uh, with the same notebook without updating the notebook file with uh, different parameters. So it essentially aims to provide a simplified user experience for, um, for the data science teams so that they can create long-running jobs, um, hiding away or abstracting away all the complex complexities involved with um, creating and managing these pipelines or dealing with multiple data systems. Now let's see how, um, how um, we are using this um, uh, Jupyter scheduler to run um, these notebook pipelines at scale. So to run this notebook in a, in a multi-tenant cloud environment, um, we've integrated the pipeline uh, essentially with the kernel spec, which we discussed earlier, where users can configure their own uh, pipelines so that um, uh, the orchestrator can uh, create an on-demand kernel to execute the pipeline at runtime. We also provide ability for users to um, link a pipeline with a specific version of notebook file, which is very essential because the notebook document itself is a mutable document, and uh, this allows users to uh, link a specific version of a pipe of a, of a notebook to a pipeline so that they can reproduce this, reproduce the experiments. And we we we've, we've um, integrated with Airflow to actually manage or um, schedule and run these pipelines on Kubernetes, which we'll talk about it later. And we also add support for notifications so that users can using users can subscribe to various notification mediums like Slack or email so that they can receive the output artifacts of a of a pipeline run, which can be a visualization with, uh, in a notebook document or pre HTML preview of a document with nice charts, uh, or uh, just a or just a notebook file, which can be shared with others. Now let's see uh, how Airflow is being used to run the pipeline, specifically a notebook pipeline. Airflow itself um, is a workflow management platform where uh, users can create pipelines uh, with multiple tasks and dependencies. It allows, um, so, um, it, so it, a task can be configured with an um, uh, Airflow operator, which is used by an uh, executor to um, execute the task. So in this diagram, if it's, uh, in this slide, we see a pipeline with four tasks, where the task one is configured to run a bash operator, which executes a bash script, and task, task two is, scheduled, uh, is configured to run a Python operator, which, is, which um, executes a Python function. 
So on Kubernetes, um, Airflow can be uh, configured to use um, the Kubernetes executor, which essentially uses Kubernetes API to create a pod, to create an on-demand pod to run these tasks, which provides th that th the benefits would be to um, provide an isolated environment or isolated uh, task for each um, in a given pipeline where every task has its own pod, which provides a greater flexibility for the users to configure the resources per each task and um, combining with the availability and uh, scalability of Kubernetes, this can also provide users to scale a parallel execution of tasks, let's say with the auto scaler, any of the auto scaler enabled. So even though the Kubernetes uh, executor provides um, um, an isolated pod for every task, the execution environment itself would remain the same because Airflow essentially would use the same base image. Executor would essentially use the same base image to run these tasks. So when combined with the when when uh, combining this with the Kubernetes pod operator, which allows user user to specify a base image or a specific, specific Docker image for each task, essentially it allows uh, to spin up a new pod from uh, while executing a task. So uh, this allows users to c customize their own environment um, where they can have uh, uh, various dependencies between the task with different packages, and also provides uh, another feature where they can actually run using uh, different runtimes like uh, Scala or Go. So this is very essential uh, for notebooks as notebooks are uh, language agnostic documents which, where, which can be used to represent um, experiments in multiple languages. So now, let's now see how um, these concepts are being used to execute a notebook pipeline at Apple. So we define our pipelines with a custom operator which, which is similar to an extended version of paper mill operator. So paper mill is, an, is an, a uh, notebook client uh, which can execute a notebook file. And we, ex we have extended the custom operator. We have added this operator where uh, it, can, uh, ex it can connect to a remote kernel by ex and execute the notebook file. Essentially, when, um, uh, uh, when a Kubernetes executor spins up a new worker pod um, during the scheduled time uh, when executing a pipeline, the worker pod, which essentially runs a task, has the con as the operator which is configured, and uh, the operator would use the pod identity certificates to launch an on-demand uh, remote kernel uh, on behalf of the user. And this kernel can be a Python kernel or a Spark job, and which which is actually managed by the orchestrator to configure this environment using the kernel spec, which we link with the pipeline. And also the 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 worker pod uses the uh, the notebook version notebook file, which is linked to the pipeline, so that it can access the version notebook file from a remote store and um, uh, execute it connecting to a remote kernel and um, um, publishing an, a, not a notification to the output artifact. So, Airflow also provides other features like um, um, runtime variables, um, which can which are, which are substituted by uh, Airflow at runtime. Um, so, these these, these can be a, a start uh, start date of pi uh, pipeline or a run date of the pipeline. And it also provides flexibility for the users to run uh, backfill jobs where these jobs that, that, that are run at, on a previous or past dates. So combining these features with um, the parameterization of notebooks, it allows data science teams a powerful way to create uh, and manage the pipelines um, uh, without uh, uh, manage these um, pipelines for various different use cases. Um, and, um, and it's mo it's even more easy to actually debug a specific pipeline as we list all the pipeline runs within a node within Jupyter workspace. Users can access the pipeline, um, failed pipeline, and um, reproduce the error using an interactive session and fix the pipeline. Essentially, um, we believe th these features would um, enhance the productivity of scientists and empower them to move their experiments and prototypes from Jupyter workspace to production environments without dealing with multiple data systems. So this, 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 the, the, this, this represents an, a notebook pipeline execution in a single cluster. And um, to actually scale these uh, pipelines across multiple clusters and multiple cloud environments dynamically, we integrated with pipeline service at Apple, which essentially provides an API to define a pipeline spec. Um, so the pipeline spec consists of uh, parameters of pipeline like schedule, a uh, schedule definition, time zone, everything, and also defines a task with the uh, with the uh, with the operator which is defined with and the parameters of that operator. Essentially, it 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 provides flexibility. It also provides features like version controlling of the pipeline so that users can track uh, changes across pipeline specific pipeline and deploy a specific and deploy a specific version of a pipeline 
to a uh, to a cluster with airflow enabled so this essentially allows uh, users to define pipeline in a, uh, a, a, a sp pipeline dsl or pipeline um, a spec and uh, provides a way for users to deploy these pipelines in number of clusters and pipeline service would be responsible to convert the pipeline dsl to an airflow supported dag which is um, which is deployed uh, so that you uh, de uh, airflow instance uh, running in the kubernetes cluster can actually execute and schedule and execute these pipelines it's also great talk provided by our partner team which describes the architecture of pipeline service in great detail it's a link to this slide essentially integrating this jupyter scheduler with pipeline service allowed data science teams to create notebook pipelines dynamically um, and um, schedule them onto any Kubernetes cluster of their choice where they can run these pipelines so that they can access the data. This, um, to recap, this, this architecture allowed us to scale both interactive and non-interactive use cases um, at scale for in multiple cloud environments. And using the concept of kernel spec, which allowed users to define their own kernel environment for various, uh, various use cases, uh, depending on their needs, and uh, using the remote kernels, uh, they uh, they uh, they can access. Uh, we, uh, they're able to access the data or compute closer to the data for both interactive and non-interactive use cases. Essentially, the the basic idea is to provide a cloud ID-like experience for data science teams with a platform using various open source technologies and um, scale on Kubernetes. So to further improve the experience, uh, data science experience on Kubernetes, we're also working on various other features like um, where uh, right now mostly we focused on creating a pipeline with single task, but we're also focusing on um, extending that to support multiple tasks where um, users can create tags from right from their workspace with multiple notebook files from their file browser where uh, one notebook can essentially um, a, a Spark notebook to pre-process the data and other, other uh, the other notebook with, which can run an ML experiment using tools like Kubeflow. And users can schedule this, the whole complete pipeline directly from their Jupyter workspace and run on Kubernetes. And we're also, um, in, to solve uh, resource contentions issues in a multi-tenant namespaces, we're also looking into uh, schedules like Unicorn to essentially provide a flexibility for the users to define their resource requirements per workload type, uh, whether it's interactive or non-interactive use case. And uh, to help further on the collaboration side, we're also working on real-time collaboration where multiple users can, um, uh, uh, can collaborate on a single notebook document. Uh, so this can be helpful when um, multiple scientists can collaborate on a single experiment in the same workspace. There is also talk from our team, which explains in great detail about the uh, real-time collaboration feature. That's it for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, and we, we have some time for questions. And uh, there's a mic in the middle of the room. Feel free to use the mic to ask questions. Is it on? Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Just have a question on uh, cost optimization. Um, how do you guys make sure that data scientists, you know, like, since they have all the power in their fingertips, not use, like, the g giant GPU nodes for, like, something really small, right? Because that's what at least our data scientists tend to do. So how do you, yeah. uh, how do you make sure you organize that and manage that? Sure. Um, to answer the question on cost optimization, so we actually, um, so one of the things which we did is to scale down um, op, uh, or um, inactive sessions. So normally, tend to users tend to use notebooks to create an experiment, and which can be a long-running session or um, leaving the workload alive. So we are we are, folks, we, are we also implemented culling, Jupyter culling, which actually um, does a lot of cost optimization by shutting down all the inactive kernels. So it measures the uh, um, activity f using the Jupyter session, and will aut automatically shut down the kernels. Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, I was just curious, I uh, think it's a great talk, very popular research challenge for enabling scientific computing. 
Um, what drew you guys towards Airflow? Is it a history relationship with Apache-based products? Is it just personal preference? Since there's a lot of flow-based operators. Yeah, so, um, so Airflow pro provides the uh, flexibility to use our own operators. So that's the essential thing which we, which we have implemented to use the same uh, configuration as we do for interactive analysis and write an operator to actually use the, all the benefits of Airflow. So that's one of the benefits from Airflow that we want to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, also, like just to kind of follow on, we do have Airflow expertise in-house. And so we have a sister team that runs Airflow at scale mm -hmm. that helps us you know, kind of get that integrated. Okay, yeah, I was just curious, thanks. Yeah, I know there are a lot of other things out there. There's Argo and so on and mm -hmm. so forth, but we're kind of right now in Airflow shop. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I saw in one of the slides you mentioned um, the scheduler is able to bring the job closer to the data, and can you elaborate a bit more on that? Oh, yes. So essentially from a Jupyter workspace, um, since we are, uh, when a user, let's say, uh, a user is trying to launch a Python kernel, so um, let's say a, a specific, uh, the workspace itself is uh, you, uh, being run, the server itself is being run, in a West region, a cluster in West region. So user can access the, um, user, user can provision a Python, Python kernel um, in a East region, and we can connect the, both the server pod and the kernel pod, such a way that we can establish a session. And the session is very secure because we also create an on-demand session key secret, which is, um, which, which only the, which is a shared secret between the server and the kernel. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question about the um, scale of uh, your, you know, your uh, whatever job with the resources. Like, how do you prevent people from over provisioning or under provisioning the resources? That one, yeah. So I think on the Spark side, we have dynamic allocation that allows scaling up and scaling down when idleness is there. Actually mentioned kernel culling as well, but um, it, it, it folks can like over provision. We kind of like are you know given the let's say the native quota mechanisms built into namespaces, we we basically will confine them to the quota in the namespace. Right? So like individual users can have quota or teams can have quota and they can be bounded by that quota. Now with Unicorn that provides us much more granular control within a namespace if there's a shared team namespace such that we can like, limit the interactive and non-interactive use cases with like sub queues, right? So we could have a per user queue and users are not allowed to go past a certain amount. And maybe there's a swim lane for some users that can like, operate in a queue that has more capacity in off hours. So those are like follow on things that we're like bringing a unicorn into the picture to understand how we can solve those problems a little more granularly. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>